it seemed to me that your instinct has, has been to be like, aha, see, they've exposed themselves. Uh, they, uh, they're really on the wrong, they're really on the wrong uh, side of this, right? You know that, and that, um, you know, frankly, I mean, this is, you know, this is like, uh, I mean, it, it, I think at its worst, it reminds me a little bit of the sort of social justice. You know, it's like, oh, you know. People like if people say say something problematic, it's like oh they've just told you who they really are, right? That's that's who they, <laughs> that's who they really are, and like none of the other stuff. <laughs> I, I'm going to grant you something here. I think that what uh, for a little while, um, partly because like somehow sometimes don't differentiate very well between one person and another in a milieu. Like I get people conflated, um, and. Partly because of just sort of an unexamined guilt by association, um, I became so angry at the majority report that uh-huh. anyone who was in their orbit, I, I was suspicious of, and that was unfair, I think. Um, and uh, so I want to apologize to. Yeah. I think I want to. I think I want to apologize to Dave Griscom. Is that right? Yeah. Maybe him. Um, and. And maybe I want to apologize to Matt Leck, possibly. Maybe I don't. Maybe I hate Matt Leck. I can't remember. But um, <laughs> but but I want to apologize to people within the orbit of of, of Sam uh, Cedar, um, because he and Bender and Emma Vigland um, made me so livid um, that I just I went. I got a little reactive. I'll just, it's, you know, uh, clearly I got a little reactive. So if you deserve a, an apology from me, I don't think that you deserve to be canceled. I apologize to you. That's, that's um, the, uh, and that, that, is the, that is the very best way to deliver apologies. I'm going to do that from now on. And say, <laughs> officially apolog- if you deserve an apology from me, let, you know, let's assume I did that. Uh, <laughs> just assume uh, it. If you think, let me put it differently. If you think I deserve that, you deserve an apology from me. This is the moment where I'm apologizing. <laughs> the death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see... We still, them. to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Okay, so today I'm here with uh, Ben Burgess of the podcast and, and the author of Give Them an Argument. Uh, he's also the podcaster behind Philosophy for the People. Are you doing that with Stefan Bertram Lee? Yeah, yeah. I've been doing weekly streams on Sundays with Stefan. They're like cross-listed with uh, GTA and This is Revolution. Cool. And um, today we're going to be talking about your new or not so new uh article in jacobin called cornell west should challenge biden in the democratic primaries <clears throat> but before we do um i'm just going to ask for your sympathy and condolences uh because of my uh recent um run-in with elon musk's twitter uh and uh ask you what's happening on twitter uh, i feel like i'm completely cut off from the world i am now i've reduced to uh, nobody and nothing uh, <laughs> a, a non-entity <clears throat> I, yeah, I, I'm on... I, I mean i do think it's really bad that uh you know people can you know like that there are these important communications platforms that we all need you know that like really are like an important place that news is disseminated and political discussion happens that you can be kicked off of so like capriciously and with so little resources i do think that's bad but like on the other hand i'm a little bit jealous that you're uh, that you're not like um that you know that like you don't have to use any willpower to uh, to not check twitter during the day <laughs> well i still have to use willpower not to check it because i have it on read only mode oh i see so they let me still look at it but i can't oh. respond to it 
That might that might actually be the worst of both worlds. Yeah, yeah it's really bad. I'm thinking what I might do is start a TikTok channel that's just Doug responds to tweets, and then I'll I'll get to respond to the tweets. <laughs> And then people can, you know, yeah, um, and, yeah. and 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 then my the ideal thing would be that if you add another step where you have to like text people all the time, have you post my TikTok? On yeah, I know, right, right, yeah, no, and then hopefully people will on their own initiative take the TikToks and uh, disseminate them on Twitter. But but yeah, I'll be sitting there going, ah, uh, when who can I ask to totally trade and why isn't it going viral? Um. But uh, yeah, th- now just for people who don't know, I think probably everyone does know that I was um, suspended from Twitter for violating their terms of service around violent speech. What I did, well, in it, there's a movie called um, starring uh, Harrison Ford. It's like a, a Grisham novel or something like that. Uh, Prime Suspect might be the name of it. I, I forget. Uh, Presumed Innocent might be the name of it. I. I I can't remember <clears throat> what it was. It was a courtroom drama. Uh, Harrison Ford plays a man who's been accused of murdering his wife. Um, the prosecutor approaches him in the hall at one point and says, we know you did it. We know you killed her. And he says, <clears throat> yeah, that's right. I killed her. I killed my own wife. And um, later on in the movie, they they bring that up as evidence that he had, had killed his wife. And, you know, of course, it, it's established that that was a biting bit of sarcasm on, mm-hmm. on his part. Uh, the, the lawyer says if, if he had, you know, the, the black lawyer says if he had been from my community, he would have said motherfucker. So um, <laughs> uh, uh, the, um, and I may have to <laughs> pull that out these days. I'm getting it from YouTube as well, but uh, yeah. So what I did was I, um, I responded to a tweet from a, an account called Post Left, which I'm sad to see is just growing in followers all the time. Um, po- Post Left Watch. And they had tweeted like, Brianna Joy Gray should be ashamed for allowing RFK to come on her show and spew vaccine misinformation. This the, He needs to be stopped. This man's dangerous, something like that. <clears throat> and I responded, how is this even allowed? RFK should be shot. Right. And <clears throat> that was, it was a, a sarcastic response, but in the world of Twitter, perhaps it wasn't read by everyone to be sarcastic. Yeah. My assumption is someone who doesn't like me very much went troll, like trawling. Through yeah, my that's, tweets. that's entirely possible. I also wouldn't be surprised if like, uh, should be shot is uh, is a phrase that's automatically uh, <laughs> automatically flagged. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and I've I've appealed and I said, listen, I I'm I'm for Robert Kennedy's you know free speech rights. I think it's a shame that he's being censored. I think it's an abomination that he's being censored. This was a, a sarcastic, sat- satirical tweet. In your terms of service, it says that is exempted, but. So far, no luck. So we'll see what happens yeah. to me. Yeah, um, we'll see. You, you might be. Um, uh, I mean, just judging by the way these things I've seen play out in other instances, I don't know if Elon being in charge actually makes much of a difference. But the way he has, like, I wouldn't be surprised if it's like a year and then randomly, you know, they, you know, they put you back. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna keep appealing every once in a while, and I'm I may anyway. I'll, who knows? Well, I, I, I'm gonna I I sent a I sent an email to RFK Jr. inviting him. To the <laughs> What's he gonna do? Well, he could he could say to uh, to to Twitter. He could say on Twitter that uh, he understands my tweet that got me suspended to be satirical. <clears throat> and he could tweet that, and then I could then refer to that tweet in an appeal. That, that's yeah, what, I'm, yeah. what I'm thinking. Yeah. Also, you know, I want to give him the opportunity to spread vaccine misinformation. So sure. I'm inviting yeah. him on. Uh, let's talk now about your your essay. I'm sorry. Well, this, is kind of, this is actually kind of funny because this, um, you know, the account that you're replying to when you got in trouble um, post left watch um, is one that um, is. Uh, you know, I mean, this is one that like will will like po- 
post about me fairly often um, for uh, for all sorts of you know for all sorts of reasons. Uh, there's I'm not sure if it's so there's Matthew Dimitri I want to say is the guy's name who you know seemed to have a very very similar Twitter account to Post Left Watch. And I'm not sure if like post left watch just is Matthew Dimitri or it's like another guy with the same basic idea. Uh, but, um, but, you know, Dimitri is supposed to be a lot too, but the thing uh, like, you know, most recently actually with RFK junior, cause I wrote an article for the daily beast saying that Hotez should, should take the invite. He should, uh, that, that he should uh, debate RFK junior on, uh, on, on Rogan that, uh, that actually, you know, it's, uh, this is like, you know, if, if you want to be, you know, a science communicator and a, you know, debunker of conspiracy theorists, all that, you should do it where people, you, you know, you should do it where people who listen to RFK will actually see, you know, see you do it, right? I mean, what's, what's the, uh, um, as, uh, as I saw Nathan Robinson say, you know, it's if you, if you refute an argument in the, you know, in the middle of the woods, you know, nobody is listening, mm-hmm. you know, does it, uh, does it matter, right? That was my point in the article. And, um, and you know, and, and he he posted about that, you know, like uh, the tweet that was like, you know, Ben Burgess, uh, or you know, was it? Because uh, the the title of the Daily Beast article was like, "Why legitimate scientists should debate RFK Jr." and and his his tweet about it was like, "Why legitimate scientists should debate David Icke about lizard people," and um, uh, and it's like, you know, and yeah, I mean, post left watch and Dimitri before that, you know, would like do things like highlight, you know, my, anytime, you know, anytime I would say something, you know, mildly problematic or, you know, or, uh, or do something like go, go on RT back when, back when that existed, uh, or, or et cetera. And, and the, you know, the reason I just think it's funny, you know, as a transition of what we're about to talk about is it's like post left watch, right? So like, presumably the, a post left watch would be, you know, would be uh, sort of clipping and and uh, and highlighting the activities of, of the post left, which um, you know I wasn't aware of being being part of. Right? I mean, that's the. I mean, I mean, like I'm I'm about to. I mean, presumably, I'm about to be savage for being a lib. You know, like what? Like I'm I'm uh, you know like like I'm but like so but to this guy, you know, to this guy, I'm part of something called the post left. Yeah, it's amazing because everyone he targets as being post left has absolutely nothing that I've seen yeah. has absolutely nothing to do with the actually existing online post left that I am vaguely aware of. Like, um, <clears throat> I you know I I could try to name some names. Like, I guess Amy Therese would be a, a particularly noxious example of a post leftist who's gone full bore, you know, like uh, Ann Coulter uh, Ann Coulter kind of style even worse than that well that's the thing so i think amy amy was like you know sort of 2020 uh it's like yeah like late 2020 early 2021 amy i think was the sort of prototypical uh post leftist but i mean now it seems like she's i mean she's just a conservative and, and I mean, like by her own account right you know like that you know is, is just a conservative um the uh I mean, I guess like maybe like was like that uh, Benedict crypto fash. Uh, that, that might be that might be an actual post. No, he 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 attacks the post left and the left. He doesn't. He hates everybody. He doesn't. Um, yeah, he doesn't I, have I, to I mean, wind up on anything. I, I mean, I know Amy always hated the term post left too. So it's like I don't. Know. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> it, you know. Maybe, maybe there just is no uh, such thing. But I mean, like, pre- but, like presumably the idea, as I always understood it. Of, you know, post leftist would be somebody who was like, uh, who thought that any sort of, um, you know, at the very least, any sort of actually existing left project was was, was totally, you know, like uh, would be something they totally rejected. Now uh, that they uh, that they they thought like, uh, you know, that I mean. I mean, I, the implication seems like okay, I'm post leftist, but I'm not actually a right winger or something like that. But uh, you know, w- whatever, um, you know, like whether or not there are any clear cut, you know, clear cut examples of that, it's uh, like it's it's certainly it's certainly not me. I mean, I'm, I'm just I'm just like a, a very you know 
very straight down the line, like boring leftist. Right. Well, uh, yeah, except that you're not fully on board with all the latest um, edicts from the Democratic Party. So that makes you post left like you. The new line from the Democratic Party is that free speech is dangerous, that, mm -hmm. that um, uh, everyday people need to be controlled, uh, that science is whatever someone in authority says it is. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh that you know it, and on and on and on but um that russia gate is true even if it isn't uh and and so on um uh that so but i i tell you uh, i may be in a, in a way verging on being a post leftist yeah. <laughs> because my my ad attitude these days and it's become uh you know my my the 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 visceral quality of my attitude is probably uh, a detriment as I try to, I mean, clearly because I, I've been booted from Twitter, um, it, is that I just don't look at the Democratic Party as anything other than an enemy of working class power and the left. And and yeah, well, I think it, I think it depends what you mean. So I mean, I, I guess that's what we're about to get into. Right. Um, like I, uh, I I I look at the results of the Bernie Sanders campaign, mm -hmm. and uh, and say, wow. Not only did he not win, but all that came out of it was that a good portion of the people who were very much uh, in opposition to the center of the Democratic Party, in opposition to kind of the neoliberal Clinton style uh, aims of the Democratic Party, have been absorbed into the Democratic Party and, you know, along the way have gone to the right of even Bill Clinton in the 90s <clears throat> by embracing. I mean, at least theoretically, I mean, it's, this is maybe a debatable point, but by embracing a neoconservative agenda that mm -hmm. the, the neoconservative like Bill Kristol types have infiltrated the Democratic Party. And um, and those who were part of the Sanders, uh, you know, campaign have been absorbed into that very same party, therefore unable to organize against the the uh, or the, the war and escalation of the war in, in Ukraine in Ukraine, unable to even understand um, the level of censorship and the expansion of the, the power of the security state, uh, <clears throat> unable to um, look at the corruption within the Democratic Party. Um, those are basically the, my main my main gripes about the Democrats at the moment. Uh, you know, also, I suppose the the the, the abandonment of any sincere effort to support labor you know working class people within the democratic party um as well but uh it, you know and medicare for all is seemingly a, a mostly forgotten dream and and so on so that's where i'm starting from is that <clears throat> the democrat if to to ask uh cornell west to run within the democratic mm -hmm. party uh, makes about as much sense, and maybe you could make a case for it as to ask him to run within the Republican Party. Um, yeah, so I, I think that the place that our disagreement maybe starts is that a lot of the stuff you just said, you're talking about the Democratic Party as if that's the name of an organization, which it's not. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, America doesn't have political parties in the sense that European or Latin American countries have political parties, things with, uh, you know, things with, like membership cards uh, that, you know, you can, you can be a, a member of this organization and you, uh, uh, and uh, there's, there's a, uh, there's an internal process for you know, deciding, you know, who's the, you know, who's the leader of that organization and there's, uh, you know, and, and there's a the platform and, you know, and, and all of, uh, all of that stuff. Um, that uh, that's that's not really what we're we're talking about, right? What we're talking about really is uh, a ballot line uh, and a and you know some some cliques of politicians uh, who are uh, you know who who are associated with you know that ballot line, the sort of branding that you know that goes with that, um, and. You know, my view for you know for a long time, you know, has uh, has been that you know it, it makes sense, uh, 
you know, I mean, that like if you're if you're going to run in uh, in American elections, uh, given that we have this you know, bizarrely anti-democratic system, uh, that you know that makes it like almost impossible to meaningfully participate in uh, in a general election. If you haven't captured one of the uh, one of the other of these ballot lines, then it makes sense to uh, to contest uh, for uh, for one of the uh, one of the uh, one of those um, one of those ballot lines uh, that and um, and that the like the idea that this sort of suggests uh, agreement with um, you know agreement with the politicians who who have it right now uh, seems odd to me because the whole reason you'd be running against them uh, is that you uh, is that you disagree with them. And I would say that, yeah, I mean, I, I think the point of principle is exactly the same uh, for the Democratic or uh, or Republican ballot line. The, the reason I would never suggest, you know, like the reason that under current conditions, at least, uh, short of some sort of, you know, unexpected realignment, uh, I wouldn't uh, suggest the Cornell West run in the Democratic, uh, the Republican primary. Isn't that I think that I have some sort of objection in, uh, in principle to that, right? You know, I, I don't. I think that, like, you know, if I were, you know, if I were a libertarian, um, then I, I would have been all for Ron Paul, you know, running for, uh, for the Republican nomination in 2012. Uh, and uh, was it 2008? I think he did it the first time. Uh, that uh, even, you know, even though, like, you know, look, this is uh, a Ron Paulite's objection to George W. Bush would be very similar to, you know, like have a lot of overlap with your and my objections to uh, to George W. Bush. But the Republican primary is where there's like a much larger cluster of voters uh, who uh, who could be won over to the Ron Paul message than the Democratic primary. So it made sense to uh, to use that. And similarly, there's, uh, I, you know, I think that there's a much larger cluster of voters in uh, the Democrat, you know, who vote as Democrats. You know, just given the way that, uh, you know, the way that those branding exercises have, you know, have played out over the years, then there are who uh, who register as Republicans and vote in Republican primaries. So that's the one that would, uh, you know, that's the one that, uh, you know, that's the one that would make sense to me, and just. You know, on you know, I mean, I think that this this whole question about the uh, the sort of long term effects of the um, Bernie candidacy, um, you know, I, I think that there's you know, I mean, if you want to call like I, I do think that. Um, you know, I do think that Ukraine is one of your examples. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how much it's it moved uh, people to the right. Uh, certainly has to some extent. Like, I, I, I mean, I wrote an article for Damage basically saying that, right, that the, the war in Ukraine was a, um, you know, was, was a way, like, basically – was a way back to the mainstream, you know, for uh, for a lot of uh, of of ex radicals. Uh, it's, I think it's called Yellow and Blues is the, uh, is the name of that article for anybody who wants to check it out. Uh, but you know, I also think that to a large extent, what was going on there is is that it just sort of exposed a pre existing fault line, right? Because if you if you look at reactions to the war in Ukraine from uh, from ex uh, you know, I, I think that um, you know, I, I think that they uh, that I think that they do tend to fall along the lines of some divisions that already existed. So, uh, so if you look at, for example, the things that uh, you know, Jack, you know, Jackman Magazine has uh, has has printed about Ukraine. Uh, you know they, they've published things that go against this, but I mean, like, there's this pretty clearly like a sort of consensus position, which is very anti-war. Uh, there, uh, if you look at you know the things that like DSA you know has uh, has said about uh, about Ukraine, you know Ukraine, 
you know, they're very anti-war, et cetera, right? So those sorts of, um, those sorts of expertise uh, have been very, you know, very anti-interventionist. But I also think that, like, you know, just crassly, there's a kind of expert, you know, like there's a kind of Bernie voter in 2000 who in 2016, they never bothered to take the Obama 2012 sticker off off one side of their bumper when they put the, the Bernie 2016 bumper sticker on, on the other side of the bumper. And, you know, that's like, because, and I think any kind of like movement that's going to have wide ranging appeal is going to have a lot of, uh, a lot of political confusion of exactly that type, right? You know, but I think that there's, I think that that sort of, uh, you know, linear wing of uh, of the of, of the Bernie camp, you know, is like probably the place where they were, the place where they'd always traveled the least distance from uh, from the mainstream was on was on foreign policy. So unfortunately, I, I don't think, you know, I don't think it's that. Uh, I don't think it's it's that shocking, although it is you know it is disappointing that you know that in in a situation like this you know people um, you know people will have this reaction or you know to the extent that maybe under the influence of you know Iraq uh, and Afghanistan those experiences you know they might have like started to drift towards better conclusions about foreign policy the the context of something that you know feels much more like world war ii again and you know this is where uh we're like uh you know can be framed as a defense of democracy especially if you don't know that much about the region uh is is something that's, that's gonna get a lot of the people back it sucks and one of the things that i like about cornell west is that he is uh one of many things i like about cornell west actually is that uh he's a lot better on uh, on those subjects uh and i would like to see Cornell West um, broadcasting uh, his uh, his anti-interventionist, for example, uh, message as, as sort of loudly as he as he possibly can, uh, and it seems to me that you know even though I mean don't get me wrong, I I you know I, I think it would be a immense long shot regardless even if he did what I wanted like you know that's I, I don't you know I, I'm not I'm not so uh, I'm, I'm not like living in such a fantasy world, you know, that I, that I think we're, we're likely to get a, a West administration. But, uh, but I do think that he would have a much better chance of, of capturing some kind of public attention for that message if he was challenging Biden for the nomination rather than, you know, rather than running the Green Party candidacy that most voters are never even going to know exists. Right. <clears throat> well, first of all, I want to respond to your your claim that the Democratic Party um, isn't an organization or it doesn't have any kind of um, mechanism for imposing discipline upon its members. I mean, it, well, while it's true well, it's that it doesn't it, do, it doesn't have well, because that was the implication of what you were saying. It, if, if you didn't weren't saying that, then you, your claim didn't really address what my claim is. Well, no, 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 no. I, uh, let me, let me talk. Uh, okay. Cause I, you know, cause you know, sure, sure, sure. a long time. Um, so uh, it's true that the, that the, the uh, it's the old form of party politics with a lot of participation from members and, and discipline amongst the members and, um, uh, and uh, a very established kind of, machine politics has is, is dwindled away and we're dealing with a kind of a commodified form of politics, a branded politics, a mass politics um, today. It's still the case that within the party, there are mechanisms in place to impose discipline upon uh, members of the party, politicians within the party, and, and that those mechanisms limit the way those members can organize voting blocks and the public during the campaign and after. So as an example, Bernie Sanders had to sign a loyalty oath uh, to the Democratic Party before he ran. That's what I just looked up. No, wait, no, no, we didn't. What are you talking about? Bernie Sanders signs Democratic Party loyalty pledge for 2020 run. This is um, NPR, uh, March 5th, 2019. B Vermont Independent Senator Bernie Sanders had to sign a loyalty pledge promising to run and govern as a Democrat if he wins the presidency in 2020. <clears throat> a new requirement for candidates that largely grew out of his own 2016 oh, yeah. campaign. Um, then also the uh, 
uh, the I mean, completely, the, completely meaningless and unenforceable, but OK. Well, but one of the consequences of that, I believe, was that when he created this new funding mechanism and new communications mechanism within his own campaign, um, which I was hooked up to, you know, I get these alerts. I'm asking you again to maybe donate five dollars to help save America or whatever it was. And there's Bernie. And I'm like, OK, Bernie, how much do you need? Um that all got turned over to the DNC after he endorsed. Well, that sounds very different from the from the what you just read. I mean, like that's that would be. A, I mean, maybe that's a provision that was. Uh, I, I, yeah, I'm not saying that that was a necessarily a consequence of that particular loyalty uh, oath, but I'm saying that uh, um, I think what actually that was a consequence of was the uh, the way the DNC, the D Democratic Party, and the DNC, I believe. Uh, put Im, imposed um, one of their own um, companies uh, that they were already working with uh, to on Sanders. So they had to he, they had to use the DNC company to create the network uh, of of outreach. That so, was his. Okay, so so look, I could be totally wrong because obviously I've never heard this. Like I, this is a story I completely missed at the time. Yeah, um, but um, but you know my guess, right? Um, could be wrong about this too. But like, is that um, is that it's it's probably not that the case that the that like the you know that there was uh, that there was like Bernie was like somehow forced against his will to um, to like. Um, to use a company that would then keep the email addresses to 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 use for fundraising later, um, maybe that's the case. But you know, but but I I would tend to assume that uh, you know actually less charitably, right? That that he just that he just did that on his own, right? You know that this that this is like that this is part of his uh, post twenty twenty strategy that you know that which uh, which you know, I don't love, uh, but you know that he has a that like. But you know he clearly, you know he clearly has taken this approach since losing the 2020 primaries, um, much more so, you know, than after losing the 2016 primaries. Uh, that um, that is like where he sort of sees himself as like a junior partner in coalition and thinks that he can exercise more influence that way, and you know, and all that, right? Like that's, you know, that seems to be where where his head has been at, you know, since since 2020. So my Again, possibly false. I didn't even know about you know. I, I didn't even remember what you're talking about from the news at the time. But you know. yeah, that, this is something I that because I donated through this, uh, you know, this uh, company. Um, you know, I I was looked into a little bit and um, and yeah, like, and I like, remember like, reading it at the it time. Like what what it was like code blue or. We love the blues or blue, blue, blue. Something I don't. That was like the name of the company. I, 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 I think that's that's the uh, that's the yeah. I, I, I mean, I would okay. I mean, I would like yeah. No, I, I definitely donated to that stuff too. I mean, I, I just think like my guess would be that that's that that's just like sort of convenience. But you know, uh, well, the point is the convenience of that meant that when he lost and and threw his um, support behind Biden. He also threw all of that, uh, all of that data, and all of those people um, into the Democratic Party fundraising apparatus, rather than being able to use it to fund uh, anything else, like a movement to put pressure on the Democrats, even or uh, an independent uh, party. Now, I understand there are many objections to to trying to form an independent party, but just to go back to what we they were addressing, what you were saying before. So the, the first thing I say is that they're running with within the democratic party has political consequences into the future in so much as they, these kinds of convenient negotiations take place, which then limit your ability to become independent of the, of the democratic party down the road limit and, and also have the consequence of taking people who are, dissident against the Democrats and bringing them into the fundraising apparatus and into the machine of the Democratic Party. Now, look, I haven't donated to Adam Schiff, even though he's now asking me to all the time. Right. Uh, it's not like the people who are uh, being hit up by the Democrats, the centrist Democrats, through Sanders 
uh, network are obliged to respond. But it, but we certainly aren't. I'm not. That's not being used to, to politicize me or to help get my support for something. Uh, oh, oh, to oh, the oh, left, you, you probably have gotten those too, right? I mean, like they have a like there are, um, like there are like like okay. So if he was using Act Blue um, to uh, for for fundraising, which is not the only fundraising method he's using by any means, right? You know, but I mean that's that's definitely one of them. Like then, sure, Democrats got your email address, which, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm just too fatalistic about this. I, I, I mean, I assume that Democrats are going to get my email address a thousand different ways, and I'm going to keep marking no, it, it all. But, yeah, but the problem is not the Democrats um, having the email address. The but, problem but, but, is point, Bernie point, not having it for something other than the Democrats. Right, and that's the part I'm disputing, because it's, it, seems, it seems to me that I've also gotten 10,000 emails since 2020 that were like, you know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to do the Bernie accent, but, uh, you know, I'm, you know, Hey, you know, Ben, I want to, I want to tell you about the, you know, about the, um, you know, union victory at Amazon. I want to tell you about, you know, I want to tell you about like this person running in this place, you know, like whatever, like that's like, like clearly the, clearly the Bernie people themselves still, still do have, those those email addresses and and the the DNC is not the only you know is not the only organization. That's I, I guess my my question would be when you've received messages from Bernie and I have too since 2020 have they been messages which are in opposition to the center of the Democratic Party? For instance, pointing to a candidate running in an area as a Democrat where the the Democratic nomination is contested and there's a Bernie bro version and there's a centrist version uh, are, or are these just ways to take um, whatever victories the working class might be having and branding the Democratic Party as somehow associated with those? Uh, well, uh, I, think, I, think that there, I think that there's been, um, I mean, I have to say, I, I, God, I mean, now I'm questioning this because, like, honestly, what we're talking about here are emails that I, I don't read particularly. You know, I, I, I love the guy, but I'm not enough to read his emails. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I mean, my impression is that some of them are in the first category, right? That some, some of these are, you know, um, you know, like these aren't emails from Act Blue or whatever. I mean, these are, these are like emails, you know, from Bernie Sanders uh, that they, and that like some of them are in support of, uh, of primary candidates. I mean, I, I guess, again, now I'm questioning myself, but I, you know, but I, I think some of them are. And, uh, and, and I don't really get the impression that, um, that uh, when he's, you know, when he's talking about like, Hey, the strike is going on, you should support it or whatever, that this is, uh, that there's any, you know, like that it's being like, I don't think the word Democrat is being used in those emails. And you could argue that he's indirectly branding him with it because he's branding himself with it or something. But, um, but yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I mean, too. So, so I guess my impression is, is the opposite of yours of both of those points, but you know, I mean, to the broader point again, like I, I would certainly not dispute that Bernie Sanders overall approach uh, since uh, since since 2020 has um, you, you know as much as I do think he's continued to do a lot of really useful and positive things, uh, it, it's also been you know far more coalitional uh, than than I would I would like you know that the uh, that um, you know I mean I, I think uh, you know I, I suspect that if uh, I suspect that if Hillary won in 2016. Uh, it might have been, you know, it, it might have been less less like this, just because of, you know, just just because of like greater antipathy or whatever. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think with I think with Biden, you know, I, I think he's probably good enough at uh, at you know making Bernie feel like he has a seat at the table. That um, that even though you know, I mean, even though he certainly um, you know he's certainly continued to uh, to you know vote against plenty of things that, you know, Biden would like him to vote for and, you know, speak out against uh, certain things or whatever. But it's like, yeah, that there, there isn't, uh, that there's the, the strategy, the overall strategy is clearly like, um, I'm, 
you know, I'm going to be the sort of leftmost edge of the coalition and try to exert influence that way, you know, rather than, uh, you know, rather than something that would be, you know, hiding the contradictions in a way that, that I would like more. I think that's true. And um, when it comes to the war in Ukraine, while the, the DSA and Jacobin have taken positions in up, you know, that are opposed to the Democratic Party's overall position on Ukraine, what is the how is it that the DSA can apply pressure within the Democratic Party um, to change the direction that, let's say, even the squad might be going in? I mean, like, it, it seems like there there is almost as long as you are unwilling to ever break from supporting a, a, the D Democratic Party overall and especially even, you know, the squad. Uh, um, then it doesn't seem to me that you have much of a an, a shot at having any political power well, as well, an organization. The problem is that even if you did, you wouldn't have any political power. That the uh, that in other words, um, like yeah, I mean the, uh, the the you know squad's mostly been been disappointing on this. Um, that uh, they're you know like you know before like God like in the very early stages of the war. You know, Ilhan Omar, you know, uh, said some good stuff and voted against some of the sanctions and, uh, you know, was like expressed all these concerns about uh, the, uh, uh, you know, like American weapons, you know, making the you know, way to the Azov Battalion and things like that. Uh, but then she she fell into line, uh, you know, I, I think on all the subsequent, you know, funding votes, you know, I think she uh, I think she she voted yes. There was the there was like the twenty four hours uh, of the, uh, the the you know congressional progressive caucus having like the ghost of a spine uh, with the the letter calling for for negotiations and then um, and then kind of scampering back to, to where they've been. I mean, they've been really bad. This is this is true. Um, the but uh, and it's not the only you know and. Um, you know, Bernie called for negotiations beforehand, but then he, he just dropped the whole subject basically. And you know, once mm -hmm. the uh, the shooting started, um, so yeah, I mean, generally speaking, the elected officials have been sort of you know somewhere in between the two poles of Bernie, as I described earlier on on Ukraine, but much closer to the bad one. Uh, and um, and yeah, I, I think there's like a much bigger structural problem here, right? That the that um, you know, because these discuss. I mean, I'm not like you know, I'm, I'm a paper member of DSA. They they get my money, but I mean, like, I, I don't. I'm not like hyper aware of of internal uh, political deliberations. But you know, from even as a sort of casual onlooker, like I do see that um, there are these arguments that will come up within DSA every now and again about how you know, somebody like somebody, some politician who's nominally a member of it, you know, it's like, oh, should we kick them out for for this or that, you know, bad thing that they did, you know, or, or, or unendorse them. And, uh, you know, there have been instances of candidates, I think there's actually a candidate who won a congressional race in Texas who was, uh, who was unendorsed by DSA because of bad Palestine positions. Um, but but I think the the overall, you know, by and large, uh, you know, like DSA has not done what some of its members have wanted and, and kicked out or unendorsed, like the you know the more prominent you know the more prominent uh, people and maybe they should, but uh, but but I think there's a there's a bigger problem which is that like let's take like AOC you know she's the one everybody focuses on because she's you know telegenic and you know and uh, and has sort of the, the most biggest media presence and all that stuff. Um, like maybe AOC is still a member, still has a, a DSA membership card. Maybe she doesn't. Um, I, I, I sort of wouldn't be surprised either way. Right. If like a sub staffer is like, you know, has like kept on top of that paperwork or not. Right. You know, since, uh, since she was elected, but let's say for the sake of argument, she does. Uh, I think that if she were told, Tomorrow, of uh, the DSA just just voted to uh, to uh, to kick you out because of your vote on this, that, or the other thing. Uh, I think her first response would be that 
the what? What what, what did we have? Oh, mm-hmm. oh, right. I remember them from 2018, right? I, I I I went to a meeting. That's the the guys in the guys in Brooklyn with all the beards, right? That's that's who you're talking about, the DSA. Mm-hmm. Um, like that's maybe an exaggeration, but I mean, like I, I think right now, unfortunately, uh, you know, DSA, while it's certainly the largest socialist organization that's existed in the U.S. in a long time, I mean, that's a little bit like, you know, William F. Buckley's line about Michael Harrington that he was the um, most prominent uh, socialist in the United States, which is a little bit like being the tallest building in Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> uh, like it's uh, it's still uh, it's still incredibly weak on on the ground, right? I mean, it, 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 uh, yeah, but let's talk about that for a minute. Well, 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 here, here's the point though, right? Like that. I think that I think right now, I, I don't think DSA kicking somebody out or endorsing them, which like, I guess if there were like a referendum, I'm doing that. I'd probably vote yes, go ahead and do it, kick them out. Right. Uh, but like, uh, that I don't think that DSA doing that, uh, would be much of a, a particularly potent threat. Because uh, because I, I think that I think that even if DSA you know like found primary challengers like like not only kicked out not only unendorsed but like found primary challengers and backed them to the hilt um, you know in the uh, the next election uh, I, I just I just don't think that they would have to break a sweat about that because uh, the it was I think it was too small a part of the coalition that elected them in the first place I think that like the, certainly the threat of like Oh, DSA is not going to knock on doors for you in the next next election cycle. Uh, doesn't doesn't really mean anything, and I think that they probably make a correct calculation that if that even if uh, even if DSA went all out against them, that they could they could weather the storm no problem. Right? I, I think that the you know that there's like last last thing I'll say about this, right? Like I think there's this sort of view that. Uh, it's very tempting for leftists to hold. It's like um, it's always 1938, like in the uh, by what, which I mean, you know, in uh, Leon Trotsky's uh, transitional program uh, published in 1938. The first thing he says is the crisis of the international working class is ultimately a crisis of leadership, and I think that that's something that leftists always kind of want to believe. That it's like, oh, the problem is that we just don't have the right line, right? If we had the right line, if, if you know, if the if the left were exerting the right kind of leadership, then, then all the good things would would happen. But I think that in the you know 2023 is more the pity in some ways, not 1938. That the uh, that they're that like the organized left is so weak, the organized working class is so weak. Even so, the organized left is even weaker. That like um, that that I, I just I just don't think that that's true. I don't think that it's that it would be exerting all this power if only it were following the the correct line. I think that you, I think that you need a much, you know, I think you need a much bigger army before the, uh, before you're, you're losing the war is the fault of the generals. Okay. Well, let's, let's, let's look at this for a moment. Uh, um, one of the, uh, there's a, there's a cliche, you know, you, you, you win the battle, but you lose the war. Uh, yeah. right. Um, and I think we need to lose a battle uh-huh. in order to win the war. Um, we have to know we're going to lose a battle uh, in advance, and the um, which and but with the aim of winning the the, the longer war. The um, this idea that okay, when it comes to having the correct line, was I don't think I mean just to be I, I don't think you mean this, but just to be clear, it was not like. You, there's a list of positions that everyone should have and you know that that because and each one you know is the best one uh you know to have and if you don't hold it like if right. like oh it wasn't like Trotsky was saying we are for trans women competing with cisgendered women we are you know ag- against Matt Taibbi as a journalist we are for you know whatever it would be. This is my you know straw man um, uh, leftist. But uh, what he means is like we have a strategic understanding of what the party is doing right. and an and an approach, a strategy uh, that is informing our tactics. And the strategy is the line. Is that basically correct? Yeah. No. No. I think that's. I think that's. Yes. That's that's what I that's what I meant. But they have a uh, that like. Um, that I think that this sort of 
permanent, the delusion of it being, you know, of, uh, I put it in Philip K. Dick terms, 1938 never ended, uh, is, um, you know, is ultimately, I think, the, the delusion uh, that, you know, like if we uh, if we just had the the correct correct strategy, right? Then then we'd be then we'd be winning right now, uh, or, or or at least you know, and, and I think even like the so really concretely in this case, right? That the um, that like look, I think that the you know if I don't know like DSA declared tomorrow that it was never going to support another Democrat, and you know, and, and only you know. Only uh, that it would only endorse candidates who are running on third party uh, third party ballot lines. Uh, it would, I mean, if if by some miracle it, it got one of these people into office, uh, I think it would continue to have the same problem, right? That they uh, that like uh, that that I that I that like you know like even like there are multi party parliamentary systems uh, where uh, where there are. You know, where even there you, you have problems with, you know, with uh, with like parliamentarians not doing, you know, what the uh, you know what the party wants wants them to do. Uh, well, and, let, let, putting putting aside yeah. the problem of discipline, that's a separate issue. Just to, as far as strategy, I want to say, let, listen. Actually, I tell you what, um, sure. we're about forty eight minutes in. We'll continue sure. on from here, but uh, but people who want to hear the next part of the conversation can go to Patreon to hear yeah. it and this is the, the moment where uh we'll break but, but all, you all, the, all the really all the really excited shit that uh that, that doug listed off earlier the the transport stuff matt taibbi etc right <laughs> all the covered in the paywall section <laughs> that's right all the bullshit over in patreon so go over to patreon to hear my bullshit If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both.